verse, or on page 355 of the Book of Common Prayer. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Blend the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Your vindicator shall go before you, 
The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then shall you call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed for this morning is Psalm 112. Let's read it responsibly, the whole verse. Hallelujah! Happy are they who fear the Lord and have great delight in his commandments. Their descendants will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in their house, and their righteousness will last forever. Light shines in the darkness for the upright. The righteous are merciful and full of compassion. It is good for them to be generous in lending, and to manage their affairs with justice. For they will never be shaken. The righteous will be kept in everlasting remembrance. They will not be afraid of any evil rumors. Their heart is right. They put their trust in the Lord. Their heart is established and will not shrink until they see their desire upon their enemies. They have given freely to the poor, and their righteousness stands fast forever. They will hold up their head with honor. The wicked, the wicked will see it and be angry. They, they will gnash their teeth and find a way. The desires of the wicked will perish. A reading from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith might rest not upon human wisdom, but on the power of God. Yet among the mature, we do speak wisdom, though it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to perish. But we speak God's wisdom, secret and hidden, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the human heart conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For what human being knows what it truly, what is truly human except the human spirit that is within? So also no one comprehends what is truly God's except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from God, so that we may understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. And we speak of these things in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual things to those who are spiritual. Those who are unspiritual do not receive the gifts of God's Spirit, for they are foolishness to them, and they are unable to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Those who are spiritual discern all things, and they are themselves subject to no one else's scrutiny. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Dawn, or maybe in a dream. 
And the mortals usually get into trouble because when they make the deals, they don't pay close enough attention to how the deal is worded. So maybe a mortal woman trades a lock of hair to a fake creature in exchange for magic that will prevent her from ever suffering illness or bodily harm. The fake creature tucks the lock of hair into his pocket and grants the mortal's wish. The woman falls asleep peacefully that night, but she never wakes up again. She lies sleeping, her head full of dreams for years and years. She never gets ill, she never suffers bodily harm, but she remains peacefully asleep. You see what has happened. The fake creature has kept his side of the bargain, but the mortal didn't pay close enough attention to the words. She got exactly what she wanted. She just never noticed the twinkle in the mischievous creature's eye or the moment when he went like this. You learned to do that in seminary, by the way. <laughs> you need a master's degree to do that. So the mortal remains asleep until true love's kiss wakes her up, or something like that. Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. Not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. One of the big mistakes that we Christians make when we read the Bible is that we see Jesus doing miracles and teaching and arguing with Pharisees and we say, oh good, Jesus has come along and finally done away with all that legalistic Old Testament stuff. Ah, 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 says Jesus. That's not it at all. You had a covenant with my Father in heaven, you see. I am simply abiding by its terms. The Son of Man smiles. <laughs> the earth around him sparkles as the dew on the hillside catches the morning light. And he continues, Perhaps you didn't attend closely enough to the words of our covenant. You see here, this stroke of the letter and that stroke of the letter over here. I am who I am, says the Lord. And I intend to fulfill my side of the bargain. Wake up, sleepy heads. And we shake ourselves awake as though from a dream. Much of the New Testament is concerned to show that in Jesus of Nazareth, God is not doing away with the covenant of what we Christians usually call the Old Testament. God is not doing away with any of that. But God is gathering up the Gentiles and bringing them, bringing us into the same covenant and fulfilling it to the last stroke of a letter. We are grafted onto the root of Israel, says St. Paul, like a wild olive branch grafted onto that which is already growing in God's vineyard. I love St. Paul's imagination, how he does things like this. He takes something like mundane, like an olive branch, and then imbues it with imaginative and theological power. That is another thing that my oldest niece and I both like about these Holly Black fantasy books. It's the way fairy magic works. Fairy magic or fae magic, it works by using mundane things in a new way, like a wild olive branch grafted onto the root of something else. In the fae lands, a, a sprig of berries worn in the hair, maybe, or a piece of string tied around the finger, a pinch of salt sprinkled in the doorway. One tradition centuries ago held that whenever fairies wanted to travel back to Ireland, and who doesn't want to travel to Ireland, the fairies would simply pluck a ragwort flower, blow through it, and then travel instantaneously back to the Emerald Isle. It's the same in this fantasy series my niece has got me reading. The way our heroes travel back and forth from the mundane world to that other world of fairies is by plucking a ragwort flower and blowing through the leaves. The ragwort becomes a pony 
that carries you from the mundane world into that other world where the fey creatures live. The humble ragwort becomes a magic fey crossing between worlds. Mm -hmm. In the church, we know something about this. About how mundane things in the life of Christ take on new power and significance. Something as mundane as the touch of a hand or a piece of bread becomes a kind of fey crossing. And no longer are we simply in the mundane world, but we are transported into God's kingdom. When we baptize someone, for example, we are still in a church with candles and fidgeting kids and HVAC systems clicking on, clicking off. We are also somewhere else, some other world where we feel the brush of angels' wings and see glory on each face. We pass through the baptismal waters into a world where God calls forth the earth from the face of the deep, where God leads Israel through the waters of the Red Sea, where Jesus himself rises from the waters of the Jordan River, a place where water is the cleansing of sin and the mark of new birth in Jesus Christ. And maybe we see him there, that son of man, standing on his green hill of beatitude, which is always just outside our periphery. That's it, he says. You're learning now. You're waking up, sleepy heads. Water poured into a font. Bread and wine on a table. These sacraments are bridges between worlds. They constitute our fey crossing as Christian people. If the sacraments are sort of like God's fey magic, then like we said at the beginning, we need to pay very close attention to the words we say during the sacraments. These are our covenant words. And it's always when we don't pay enough attention to the words that we mortals get into trouble. Every letter, every stroke of a letter is important. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come to fulfill, says the Lord. Not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass until all is accomplished. In the Episcopal Church, at every baptism and confirmation, we hear this question. Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? And we say, I will with God's help. Respect the dignity of every human being. We don't pay enough attention to those words. I think the thing that we miss is this. We don't get to dictate the terms of someone else's dignity. We don't get to dictate the terms of someone else's dignity. But we have to respect it. Wake up, sleepyhead, says the mysterious man by the window. If we get married, some of the covenant words we say during the marriage ceremony are these, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish. Let's be honest, you have to be a bit mad to say something like that. <laughs> <laughs> that got a bigger laugh than I, than I thought. There's some stories. That's great. Sometimes, maybe you wish the vows you had made included to tolerate and to ignore as needed. <laughs> but that's not what we say. It's to love and to cherish. Wake up, sleepy heads, says the grinning figure on the hillside. In a couple weeks, we're going to observe Ash Wednesday. The covenant words that we hear on Ash Wednesday are maybe the hardest ones. <laughs> Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. In my experience, most of us receive the reminder of our own mortality with a healthy mix of humility, gratitude, and holy fear. <clears throat> What's hard is that we can't bear to see those ashes smeared on the foreheads of people that we love. We don't like seeing it so clearly there on that particular forehead of our spouse or child or friend or parent. We spend a lot of time and energy trying to ignore the dark smudge of mortality 
wording our homes and conversations against it with incantatory distractions. We would rather fall back asleep than wake up in a world where we look for our beloved and find them gone. As Mary Magdalene and the other Mary go to look for Jesus at the tomb and find him gone. When faced with the death of our loved ones, we are confronted with everything hard. Unhealed wounds in the relationship, unexpressed words of love, the practical business of loving somebody like, like insurance and who's going to take care of the cat. When faced with the dark smudge of mortality, it is easy to go numb or to get angry or let resentment towards family or self or God calcify around our hearts. And sometimes we forget that this person we love so dearly was pure gift from God from the very start. When we came into this world, we were never promised, we were never guaranteed we would ever get to do life alongside someone like that. That blessed miracle. How did God make this beautiful creature out of out of dust in his own breath. And yet here we are, getting to hold their hand while they die. Here we are, getting to hold their hand as this part of the story ends. Here we are, getting to say goodbye to them as they take their last earthly fate cross. Wake up, sleepy heads. Don't delay. Say the thing you haven't said. Thank them for the ways they have loved you well. Forgive them for the ways they have loved you poorly. Ask for their forgiveness too. And then keep reading the story so you can see how it really ends. How every letter, how every stroke of a letter is fulfilled in God's covenant that is his love letter to you. One day, we all really will come to the tomb and see that same mysterious angelic figure that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary meet, that mysterious fey minister of God who says to them, No, 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 don't be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He's not here, sleepy head. He has been raised, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. My fellow sleepy heads, my fellow beloved in the Lord, it's time to wake up. Come and see. Come and meet him face to face. It's time for true love's kiss. Amen. Amen.
Peace, my homie. Hey. Peace, my homie.
and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because in the mystery of the Word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts, to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, to forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
is we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.